Welcome to Catholic Courses production of this lecture series, The Cardinal Virtues. My name is Professor William Madison. I'm an Associate Professor of Moral Theology and an Associate Dean of Undergraduate Studies at the School of Theology and Religious Studies at the Catholic University of America. I'm also the author of a widely used college textbook entitled Introducing Moral Theology, True Happiness and the Virtues. And True Happiness and the Virtues is exactly our topic for this lecture series. Later talks in the series will examine topics such as the nature of happiness, the concept of virtue, or how grace transforms the Christian virtuous life. Still later talks will examine each of the four cardinal virtues individually. But our question today is an opening, most fundamental one. What we're going to examine today is the relationship between morality and happiness. Now you might say, well, surely this must be a mistake. This is like talking about apples and oranges. What does morality have to do with happiness? Sometimes when we hear the term morality, we think of externally imposed obligations, burdens, things that actually thwart our ability to be happy and live a good life. And this is indeed a common perception of morality. But it's actually my endeavor today in this first lecture to make the case that morality and happiness are so intertwined that it really could be said that living a moral or virtuous life is living a happy life. So in this first talk, we're going to proceed with two main points. The first point is going to examine that relationship between morality and happiness by looking at an ancient story from Plato's famous dialogue, The Republic, and examining the question, why be moral? Why be virtuous? Why be just? Then the second part of our talk today, we'll look at particularly Christian sources, namely passages from the scripture, to see if the perspective espoused in the first half of the talk, which I'll call the morality of happiness, is indeed present in our scriptures and in our tradition more broadly. So first, let's look at this question, why be moral? Now, let's just be clear about what we mean by this question. Everybody knows that morality entails a bunch of rules. Don't kill, don't steal, don't betray your friends, don't commit adultery. So the question that we're asking in this talk is not which of those rules is right or wrong or whether it applies in a particular case. We're actually asking a much more fundamental question than that. We're asking, why do we endeavor to live by rules in the first place? Why do we say you shouldn't do anything? Or why are there rules like don't kill or don't cheat or don't steal? Relying heavily on the work of a famous uh, Belgian Dominican priest named Father Cervais Pinkhairs, I'm going to try to make the case that there are two main answers to this question in the Western, Western moral tradition. Now, there are variations on both of these answers, to be sure. And of course, there are religious and non-religious people who espouse both of these answers. But I'm going to make the case that the two basic answers to this question are a morality of obligation and a morality of happiness. And I'm going to also try to make the case that a morality of happiness approach to the question, why be moral, is the best answer, and it's the one that's actually truest to the best of our Catholic tradition. So now to explain these two approaches, I invite you to consider with me an ancient story found in Plato's famous dialogue, The Republic. So let me tell you a little bit about this story. As in all of Plato's dialogues, there are people having a conversation about great, ultimate, fundamental questions in life. And in this section of The Republic, the author, Plato, is writing about his protagonist, Socrates, in discussion with other people about the particular question, why be moral, or why be just, why be ethical? In the section I want to focus on today, we hear the answer to that question, not from Socrates, but from another character named Glaucon. And here's what Glaucon has to say about why people are moral. He starts by saying, look, everybody wants the same thing. We all want to outdo others and get more and more. That's what people are like by nature. So really, the best thing that could happen for you and me would be able to get whatever we want, to outdo others and get more and more. However, as good as that full happiness would be, the worst thing that could happen to us is that we were victims of others who were doing whatever they want and outdoing us and getting more and more. In fact, Glaucon says an interesting point here, a point which I agree with, while not his whole scenario. 
He says that for us, as good as the good scenario is of being able to do whatever we want and face no negative consequences, the bad scenario of being a victim of others who do that is actually perceived as worse to us. Think of an example that might illustrate that. Think back to when you were a childhood and on the playground, times you may have been picked on or bullied or teased. Now, I'm sure there were probably occasions when you were the one doing the teasing or bullying or picking on. But of course, what do we look back on our childhood and remember most? The times that we were victims of that. So Glaucon's on to something, I think, here, that people tend to fear the negative consequences even more than they're drawn to the positive scenario. So what does Glaucon say that we do, even though what we really want is full happiness to do whatever we want, but we fear being victimized by others? Well, according to Glaucon, What we all do is live according to rules. We basically come to an implicit, it's not explicit, agreement that I won't kill you, you won't kill me. I won't cheat on you, you don't cheat on me. I won't steal your stuff, you don't steal my stuff. So the basic origin of moral rules uh, in humanity, according to Glaucon, is an agreement or contract between people. And according to this agreement or contract, we're all willing to sacrifice what would make us truly happy, doing whatever we want at the expense of others, in order to avoid that more fearful extreme being victimized at the hands of others. So the most important thing to notice about this account of Glaucon, about uh, where moral rules come from, is that following the rules is not constitutive of our happiness. Now, we may agree to do it. We may do it willingly because we're hoping to avoid an even worse scenario. But being moral is not really what you and I want to do. And he uses the famous Ring of Gyges story to make his point. Those of you who are fans of the Lord of the Rings might recognize aspects of this story. According to the Ring of Gyges story, there was a shepherd out walking one day, doing his shepherd thing. And as he walked through the crags, he found in a crevice a little ring. And he put on the ring, and he found to his astonishment that it became invisible. Unable to believe his eyes, he took off the ring. What happened? He became visible again. Tried again, put on the ring, and he became invisible. So according to Glaucon, what does this guy do? This guy goes right off to the king's palace, kills the king, usurps his kingdom, takes the queen, and basically gets to do whatever he wants. Now, this is, of course, just a thought exercise, but here's the reason why Glaucon raises it. Glaucon says that even if this shepherd had called himself or been regarded by other people to be just and moral before finding the ring, this is exactly what he would have and should have done. Because the only reason, of course, that we're just or moral is we don't want to face the negative consequences imposed by our parents or society or the law when we do bad things. So if you or I had the chance to do whatever we want and not face the consequences, we would do exactly what the shepherd in the Ring of Gaiji's story did. Now, I know this sounds a little outlandish, but it actually might be closer to our experience than you think. So, for instance, uh, as a teacher of college students, I commonly hear students say things like this. If you could cheat on a test and guarantee you wouldn't get caught and you'd get an A, would you do it? Or if you could cheat on your boyfriend or girlfriend with someone that maybe you really desire and you can guarantee that you wouldn't get caught, would you do it? Now, if you think about it, this is exactly the same type of scenario as the Ring of Gaiji's story. The assumption in that little playful thought exercise is that the only real reason that we're honest in our academic activities, we're honest in our relationships, is that we're trying to get something or avoid negative consequences. So therefore, if you can get whatever you want and avoid the negative consequences that follow from breaking the rules, presumably you would do it.